Sean, man, thanks so much for coming on the show here today. Really excited to have you on and have a chat. Could you start by just telling us a little bit about yourself? Cool. Uh, thank you for the invite, Mike. Um, generally thrilled to be on. Um, and yeah, just having the opportunity to chat with you. Uh, I think yeah. it's especially meaningful for me because uh, growing up in the industry, kind of in the in the mid to late noughties, you were definitely part of that kind of T Nation elite FTS kind of uh, yeah. gang going on that scene and definitely had a significant impact on my career growing up. So, uh, I mean, That's first awesome. off, man, a bit of fanboy action, just expressing <laughs> my gratitude to, uh, to you uh, for your contributions yeah. to the industry and, and then to my personal growth as well. Um, Thank you. I mean, for me, I've taken very much uh, a kind of crossbreed path in my career i've always described myself as a little bit of a mongol um so i run my own strength conditioning business uh where i'm involved in kind of private coaching uh consultancy small contract type work um and my primary focus my primary realm is youth athletes at the moment um which i find incredibly rewarding as a yeah i'm sure we'll get into and, and chat about um but in addition to that kind of practical work uh, i also work as a strength conditioning lecturer that's primarily with the amazing team at Middlesex University in the UK. Um, I've also worked a lot with the University of Bedfordshire, uh, did my PhD there, and um, okay. also for the last few years as a, a guest lecturer for the for the PGA, Professional Golfers Association. Oh, so wow. Okay. That's been really that's cool. cool, man. Um, yeah. Yeah. Passionate about education, passionate about youth athletes, and uh, yeah, just trying to learn and evolve and, and make this field and myself even better. Yeah. I love it, man. So talk to me. What originally got you started in the world of physical preparation what started this journey for you i mean i'm sure you've heard this a million times it's the failed <laughs> athlete story isn't it uh, yeah. yeah grew up um playing a lot of um football sorry soccer uh soccer yeah. and rugby growing up um clear early on that i wasn't gonna make a, a decent living out of doing that <laughs> so uh Definitely wasn't the most naturally technically gifted athlete so I had to work hard on kind of physicality and all the other sides of the game so that's where that kind of determination and hard work outside of, of the sport becomes really important. And yep. that determination led me into the gym and discovered a genuine kind of passion for, for the weight room, um, for speed development, and ultimately for, for strength conditioning. Um, found I really enjoyed the process of training, um, the improvements that you see in yourself. And, and the passion kind of led me down the, the sports science path. Did that as an undergraduate degree and, and then continue to learn. Um, got into the master's strength and conditioning at Middlesex University. And that's kind of where my career in strength and conditioning started. Um, at that time, I took up an internship with the English Institute of Sport and GB Badminton. Mm -hmm. um, worked with a really great coach there called Andy Alford. Um, yeah, and that's where, uh, that's where my journey began, really. I love it. I love it. And then I always love to get this question, too, because I think it's so powerful and so important for young coaches to kind of get a feel for you don't go from your university to your dream job or opening your own gym so could you like fill in some of those career gaps for us and just let us know some of the stops that you maybe took along the way cool uh, i mean the journey's uh it's a weird one to describe because it, it's certainly not what you describe as linear or traditional um <laughs> yeah so after the internship with um the eis which finished kind of 2010 time um i went through a period of three to four months where i had i think eight job interviews um Oh three of them were second interviews didn't get one of them so that's oh. kind of the uh crossroads <laughs> point where you can either yeah. keep on keep on trucking and going down that path or go hey i want to take control of my own destiny here um so that kind of prompted me to to set up my own venture which uh eventually became known as maloney performance which is hey not the most original of names <laughs> uh certainly not something i'd pick um again with my business brain hat on but um yeah yeah, so I started um, down that path and just gradually picked up athletes that I knew in the local area, um, started to harness some of the relationships I already had, like with Badminton England. So I've had three or four tenures there working with the junior pathway programs, uh, worked with Wasps Rugby, um, leading a mm -hmm. kind of small academy development site until the money ran out. Um, headed the SNC for the University of Bedfordshire for a few years while I was there, so um yeah, it's just picking up lots of different kind of projects and collaborations um, as part of kind of starting your own small business. Um, yeah. From the teaching standpoint, um, I guess I've been quite privileged to teach everywhere I've studied. So I guess that yeah. kind of reflects well on on what I've done there. Um, so immediately after the master's, I did a little bit of work with Coventry University. They were setting up their master's at the time. And that was where I'd done my undergraduate um, 
been working with Middlesex since 2012, 2013, on and off, um, and then started my PhD at University of Bedfordshire in 2013. So I had some teaching responsibilities there, and I've kept teaching with Bedford and kept teaching with Middlesex ever since. Yeah, it's just interesting because I have always thought of coaching and education as very kind of intertwined. I don't think a lot of people think of it that way, but I think coaches are inherently kind of educators. And so it's interesting to see where you've found this way to like merge the two and, and, you know, in a lot of ways have like these two very similar yet parallel paths in your, in your career. Yeah, hundred percent. And coaching is teaching, teaching is coaching. So yeah, they're very much like the nuts and the bolts of it are slightly different, but I guess the general philosophy is an underpinning, um, underpinning nature of it. Um, it's very similar and hopefully yeah. really complementary. Um, certainly probably more so for the teaching side. Um, you need to have skin in the game, I think. Um, yes. In order to deliver the best experience for the students. hundred percent. Agreed. 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 Okay. So let's start with a topic that I know we're both passionate about and that's training young athletes. Why do you enjoy training young athletes so much? I mean, hands down, it's the impact that you can have on their lives. Um, so it's not just about developing the physical qualities. It's about developing everything around that. So instilling confidence, um, resilience, a growth mindset. And, and with these sorts of athletes, you can, you feel like you have more of an impact on the adult they can become and ultimately what they can achieve in their, in their life, in their career. And, and that goes beyond sport. So with the younger age group, we can start to set in those foundational habits, those foundational behaviors that, that go beyond the weight room, go beyond the training field and, we can start to develop life skills such as perseverance, resilience, teamwork, and and those hopefully will, will serve them really well in whatever path they choose to go down, whether that's a sportive path or not. Um, I mean, the, the training sessions themselves are just really fun to coach, uh, particularly <laughs> yeah. the younger you get. Um, I mean, we beg, steal, and borrow from every kind of discipline under the sun really whether it's kind of gymnastics parkour chase tag animal flow yoga weightlifting you name it we've probably got some sort of influence there within the program um yep. and that diversity of activities keeps things really fun really engaging not just for them but for for me as well um and we're just seeking to create an environment where they can where they can play where they can explore and have fun while they're doing it um yeah and it's not that you can't do this stuff with with pros. It's just there are a lot more barriers and there are a lot more uh, roadblocks in the way that maybe stop you from going as far down that route as as you can with the younger ones. Um, yeah. And I guess lastly, with the, with the kids, um, they just come with a completely different energy. Um, that kind of freedom, enthusiasm, um, kind of unshackled nature is really cool, really fun. Um, and ultimately, it's, it's contagious. It rubs off on you if you're... Um, if you have that sort of energy around you. For sure. I just love the idea of the growth mindset. And this is something that I've really tried to instill in virtually every athlete that I've coached, whether it's a young athlete in the weight room, right, or in a speed camp or something like that, as well as when I've coached them, you know, my kids are at a certain age now. So I coach them in baseball, basketball, soccer. Anytime you can go out there and start, you know, the whole, I'm not good at this. And then the whole, well, you're not good at this yet. Right. And just trying to help them understand that there's work and that, you know, if you want to be good at something, there are a select few that are pretty darn good right off the bat. But most of us, they get to a certain level, have to work to get there. And just trying to instill that in them and help them learn that via the weight room or sport, I think is so rewarding. 100 percent, 100 percent. And with our groups, we'll generally find that there will be some people that can do some things well and some people that can do other things really well. So making it um yeah making it as inclusive as possible and showing that different people will have different strengths and using yes. the group to kind of mentor each other and to um yeah to serve as to serve as role models for one another in, in those different aspects yeah when when we have kids like that especially when they start to compare we always try and help them understand that everybody has superpowers right? Every, every kid likes superheroes, or at least most of the ones that I've interacted with. So when you can say, well, you just have to find your superpower. And then it's like a challenge to them, right? Like, okay, well, this guy might be really strong, but I'm really fast. Or I'm, I, I can run forever. So helping them find their own superpowers, I think can be very rewarding as well. 
yeah, it gives them so much power. Um, and in that power, in that confidence comes the ability to then to then push themselves in some of the other realms and to, to develop their, their superpowers, their super strengths, and to also be working on the weaknesses and, and taking away some of the roadblocks that might be holding them back in terms of injuries or performance. Yeah, I love it. So I'm really interested in these workouts. <clears throat> Excuse me. Talk to me more about your workouts because I think a lot of times people want to make kids into mini adults. Right. And all of a sudden it just looks like a group fitness class or you're just doing like squatting and bench pressing and lunging. And I love kind of your mindset and where you're going with your workout. So could you talk to me a little bit more about that or explain maybe some ways you try and shape these workouts to make it really fun and engaging for your athletes? Yeah, I think that challenge sometimes comes from the kids as well. Um, some of them kind of want to be training like mini adults some of the time. And yeah. it's yeah sometimes surprising how it is challenging to get them to play and do stuff without a script and without a rule book, which is, which is a little bit worrying because I think in, um, certainly in my day, we would go out and we would free play and we would do stuff and we would yes. create things. And there's probably not that same extent of a free play that there was. Um, so trying to provide a safe space for that and set some environments up that naturally afford that. So, um, Jeremy Frisch's work with um, with like obstacle course racing is kind of yep. well and truly in the zeitgeist of S and C now, and um, we do a lot of that type of stuff. Um, I think one of the things we do a lot in the um, I'm hastened to say the warm up bit of our sessions, but the the start of our sessions, we will yep. have several station based options where some of it might be some obstacle course jumping parkour type things. Um, probably the best piece of equipment we've got in the gym is a big crash mat where they can practice tumbling. <laughs> they can start to do flips. They can do long jumps, cartwheels, a million different things. Um, we've got quite a heavy cricket group at the moment. So they love doing like diving catches and acrobatics and things on that. Um, we can set some high hurdles up and naturally that will afford some like hurdle mobility drills, some step overs, maybe even starting in, to work in some tuck jumps and things like that. We set the small hurdles up. They start to do some hops some some running patterns like, They'll start running wickets by themselves without even instructing and doing that. Um, and then what we try and do is just explore different options for doing it. So when we see one of the kids do something that's a little bit different to the other kids, hey, let's look at X and we're going to all try and then copy that and right. then we'll move on to the next person and we'll see if they can do that in a different way. Um, and sometimes that might be me coming in and then giving them different suggestions, but um, allowing them the, the space to explore without there being a right and without there being a wrong. So they're not yeah. bound to a performance outcome. There's no success per se. It's just trying things out, seeing what works, seeing what doesn't. I love that. Okay. So talk to me because one thing I'm always interested in, and I asked Jeremy the same question when he was on the show, how do parents react to this? Right? Because there's a lot of parents that think, oh, if little Johnny isn't getting faster, stronger, you know, like these tangible things in their workout that it's not valuable. And then they come to you and they're, you know, running into mats and diving and tumbling and doing all these crazy things. Do you ever get any blowback from parents? And if so, how do you address that? We generally don't. We get we get the emails and we get the messages about we need to be improving speed or we need to be improving strength sure. or power. So as long as we feel we can make sure we're evidencing that we are tick boxing that within the general program, um, generally they're pretty happy. Um, I think, yeah, generally we've had some really good feedback from the kids, which is the key thing. If the kids are there and enjoying the sessions yep. and we're starting to instill things like eating four different portions of vegetables a day, three different fruits a day, drinking, going to sleep at an appropriate time, and they're starting to take that home with them, I think then that helps the parents buy into the kind of holistic nature of things. Um, and ultimately, it's down to how they're how they're performing in the sport, I guess, in terms of the the parents being happy or not. And we're generally good at, at getting results and making positive changes in that regard. So, if the yeah. sport's going well, generally the parents are happy. Yeah, yeah, and and you and I both know because we've done this long enough. Like all of those foundational movement skills carry over to every sport. So it's almost like assured if you're doing these things, you're going to see the improvements. It's not the way that a lot of people would think you need to go about it. Cause again, they, a lot of people tend to think in this very linear fashion, like, Oh, if you want to get faster, you just have to sprint. And not that those things are wrong. Right. But having this holistic nature with your younger athletes and like really broadening their movement base and foundation, 
you and I both know it can make such a powerful impact on them, not just in the short term, but in their long term development as well. Yeah, and it makes them more adaptable. Like we're working yes. on speed in pretty much every session, but we're working on yeah. speed in a in a slightly different way. So we're challenging yeah. the ability of them to get themselves into those shapes and make those patterns, but do so from a standing start, from a side on start, from being in a clinch with somebody because you're yeah. trying to get away and evade a partner. Um, yeah, so I guess from a motor uh, from a motor learning standpoint, sorry, that should be resulting in a more robust and reliable movement pattern that will stand up under under high pressure situations under fatigue uh, when they need it ultimately absolutely i love it so another thing that that you and i kind of discussed and i know you're very focused on is this concept of empowering your athletes and i absolutely love that i love that term and just that mindset why is this important to you and then second what are some ways that we can go about doing it um I guess uh, pro probably the main thing is being able to um, being able to get that that confidence aspect. Um, I mean, Joe Ken probably popularized the um, the quote that the thing that transfers the most is the confidence aspect and the confidence mm -hmm. transferring from the weight room in that you've prepared your body effectively to cope with the rigors and, and demands of your sport. So ultimately, it's the confidence factor that I think that I think transcends. Um, when athletes have that confidence, um, then it's going to positively influence their mental skills, but also their physical skills as well. Um, and I think the empowerment goes beyond just the physical aspect, but also in terms of preparing athletes for the, for the stresses that they'll ultimately encounter within their career. Um, working within sports such as badminton in the UK, which has had kind of a history of funding being given and then taken away, and suddenly you're losing your S&C support and you need to be able to, to cope with that. And if you're a 16 year old academy football soccer, uh, yeah. soccer athlete over here. Football is fine, um, man. We're, we're, we're multinational here. Love it. Um, <laughs> if you're getting kicked out of your academy at 16, like hopefully you've been set up with the tools you need to then train by yourself until you can find yourself a trial at another club or worst case scenario, you just need to train to be active and healthy for the rest of your life. So and that's really important. Um, so equipping them with the mindset and the skills to be able to uh, to make informed decisions and, and take control of their own development. Um, yeah. And if you can take control of your own development and be more invested in it, then that makes you more resilient in in terms of your mentality and you're more likely to cope uh, to cope better. Um, in terms of actually the empowerment piece, um, I mean there are a few ways, but again, it all comes to to athletes being able to take ownership and. And as a coach, giving them an appropriate level of autonomy uh, in the program. So making sure they're involved in the decision making process, making sure they the athlete has a voice and making sure that voice is heard. So when they do have that sense of ownership, then then they're more invested, they're more motivated. Um, obviously, that level of autonomy will need to be dependent on the level of the athlete. So sure. with one of our nine year olds, that's going to look different to one of our <laughs> like 34 year old vet basketball players who's been around the yeah. block a little bit more. But um, right all athletes will have choice kind of baked into what they do and baked into their program. Um, and some of those choices might seem unimportant on the surface. It might be choosing whether to do the left leg or the right leg first on a river elevated split squat. It might be what music goes on in the gym, but it's still something that they have choice over and they are starting to control their environment. Um, and then with our more trained, more seasoned athletes, then they have greater ownership of um, the exercises, maybe even the methodologies that, that they know work for them. Yeah. Um, within the autonomy piece, I think it's important to think about how we're kind of periodizing that and structuring that over the, over the macro cycle. So in kind of a harder preseason training blocks, that's probably a time where we will have more physical challenge. We're maybe more focused on developing weaknesses and overcoming some of those roadblocks to performance. Uh, and maybe in those, those cycles, those phases, the autonomy is slightly less and it's slightly more about the group collective and, and challenging um, challenging their mentality as well as their physicality. Um, but when we're kind of moving into um, into those big playoff periods, um, end of season championships, then then we're probably going to get more individualized. There will be more autonomy. There will be more focus on developing those super strengths, those superpowers, and um, building their confidence as they go into those um, those key per uh, key periods of the year. Um, I think the last point is probably then making sure that you have a clear rationale and that that rationale is understood because if athletes are 
empowered with understanding the why behind things, hopefully that will motivate them more to be engaging in the behaviors that they need to, uh, to ultimately be successful. Um, again, that needs to be tailored to the, to the athlete's level of interest and their comprehension. But, um, yeah, in essence, it's about fostering their, their independence and their ability to take control, to take ownership. Yeah. I absolutely love that. And it, it just makes me reflect on, you know, been doing this for a little while now and I've seen, you know, like kids that I started with in high school that are now, you know, 30 year olds married, you know, starting families of their own and just thinking about that process that you go through with them. Right. And I think at the start, it is a little bit more rigid, right? The decisions they get to make are probably uh, fewer and further between, but you let them start to take some ownership. And then the longer you work with them, right? Once they have the fundamentals down, it's really cool when you send an athlete off to college and their strength coach says, wow, this is like the best moving athlete, or they're, they're willing and able to speak up for themselves, right? Like maybe a particular work, a uh, particular lift doesn't work for them. So they know alternatives because they've been around the block and they've tried different things and they can say, you know, for me personally, a back squat doesn't feel the best, but if I front squat or if I, uh, two kettlebell goblet squat, or two kettlebell front squat, those types of options feel better on my back or whatever. It's really cool to see that evolution. And then like you alluded to at the end of it all, right? Everybody hangs them up at some point, right? You can go down to the, the, the rec league and, and, you know, get buckets on somebody, but at some point you stop playing at, a, at your highest level and to be able to continue to train and take care of your body at the highest level. I think that's really empowering for me as a coach to see your athletes, kind of go through that process and see their evolution yeah um and certainly i guess the crowd that i work with a lot would be passed on to somebody else so giving them that yes that filter for what works for them what doesn't work for them and, and what you said about having the confidence to to speak up and know your body and to be empowered with that it's is massive um and ultimately at the end of career like most athletes are going to be dealing with stuff and they need to know how to deal with that stuff um, and still yes. train and still be active and still be able to play with their kids and play with their grandkids ultimately. Um, yeah, I love it. So in our emails leading up to the show, you talked a lot about building an athlete's confidence. So I really got a couple questions here. The first one is more directly to you because something you mentioned was the weight room helped you build confidence. Right. And it did the same for me. So I love that. And I'd love to hear a little bit about your story, how the weight room helped you and then how you're helping your athletes now build their confidence in the weight room or via working. With you. Cool. I mean, that first one can get super deep. Um, I think there are probably a couple of keys in, in kind of my realm of it. Um, so first with me, there's definitely been a kind of not good enough complex. And that probably comes from not being the best at things yeah, I wanted to sure. be good at. Um, sure. I guess with the gym, you get that, um, you get that validation fairly quickly, uh, and you get that real tangible progress in, in your abilities, your capacities, and that's incredibly rewarding and really boost your self-confidence. Um, yep. and I think second is probably the control factor. So when there are things in your life that you maybe can't control, having an outlet of things you can manage and manage predictably becomes like a, a psychologically safe space. Um, mm -hmm. and it's something that definitely like the gym rewards discipline it it rewards consistency um probably two traits and two t characteristics that i really value um so yeah without getting too deep that's probably mm, that's probably my story yeah. behind things um when it comes to the athletes i work with um competence maybe takes a different form so that there's definitely that kind of self-esteem factor uh, to play but it's probably more so about the being able to train injury free without restriction and being able to take away any, any roadblocks and performance that are potentially holding them back. So I guess the first priority with any, any S and C program is maximizing uh, the athletes availability to, to train and perform at the highest possible level so they can get the most from, from their sport training sessions, um, yep. making sure they're not going to break down and making sure they are not thinking about the ankle or the hamstring. So, they can focus on the sport and what they need to do. Um, right. Second, in terms of the roadblocks, like we want to make sure that athletes aren't limited by the lack of speed, the lack of power, uh, lack of strength. So um, making sure that they can capitalize on all the, all the affordances and the movement landscape um, and their physicality isn't, isn't a limiting factor for them. So yeah, it's probably more a dual approach here in terms of yes, the self-esteem and the confidence factor, but 
also the confidence in the in the physicality in their body and being yeah. able to do what they they need to do and want to do yeah i like that i like that a lot something i wrote down here was growing up i only played team sports right so it just depended on the year but you know baseball basketball soccer volleyball i played every team sport and i always enjoyed the weight room but it wasn't until i got into powerlifting that i learned the value of an individual sport right or like a stopwatch sport as they would say because it's very clear if you have put in the work or not right you go to a powerlifting meet you haven't trained doesn't matter it doesn't matter to anybody else in there whether you put in the work but if all your lifts have stayed exactly the same because you haven't put in the time and the work okay that's on you right versus that the just like how great you feel after you put in three, six months of really hard training and now all your lifts have gone up, your technique's better, you're more confident. Like, I think there's huge value in that. And that's one of the things that the weight room offers you, right? Like team sport, you can be reliant on others versus like you alluded to, the weight room is one area where it's 100% on you. Either you put in the work or you don't. Yeah, you're 100% accountable. Um, yeah. Some people love that. Some people struggle with that. And um yeah, it's a, it can be a very different different dynamic and, and different set of challenges to, to team sport. Yeah, just a random aside, but my daughter ran track two years ago, and I think she's <laughs> going to get back into it this year. But I think that was really eye-opening for her as well, you know, because she went and she did her first race, and she did okay, you know, but she realized very quickly, okay, this is not my middle school, right? There's This is like a really good track meet. There's really fast girls, okay. But then also... Two months later, if you haven't put in the work and you haven't trained the way you need to, you're not magically just going to get better. So, again, I just think there's value in that for just kids as a whole to have that balance of team sports to give you that camaraderie to help you learn how to work as a team. But those individual sports to learn, hey, look, can't blame anything else on anybody else here. It's all about you and your effort and your desire to get better. So I think there's yeah. value in both. I love that. Yeah. Um, and for some of the, some of the individual athletes, that's the kind of things that we can develop in, in the group sessions. Um, there is that yeah. kind of, there's that opportunity for, for group interaction, for working as teams. Um, but then when it comes into like the lift portions of the sessions, like, like it's you, it's you and that sheet of yeah. paper and things need to be going up from, from week to week, from month to month. And Yeah. I love it. Okay. So let's, shift away from athletes for a little bit because another topic very similar right uh the the more i learned about you we're very very similar in the sense that i know you're very passionate about educating and and building the next great generation of coaches as well so i'd love to hear i love to hear people's stories like what motivates you like why is this important to you and how did you have people around you that molded you as a young coach yeah, definitely. Uh, I think reflecting on my own journey, um, I had the privilege of being mentored by Andy Olford when I was doing my internship at the EIS. Um, Andy was an exceptional mentor in many ways. Um, his character was very different from mine, certainly at the time. Um, so probably more as an introvert and somebody that um, probably suffered with social anxiety a little bit um, when yeah. I was starting off in my career. He was a fantastic people person and just being able to to observe and learn from him was fantastic in my development and gave me a lot of confidence in, in my ability to interact with athletes and other members of the kind of multidisciplinary support team. Um, and his background was kind of more so in the agility side of training um, for badminton, mm. which coming as a kind of Jim Wendler 531 at the time, disciple, uh, <laughs> yeah. wannabe powerlifter. Yeah, was a, a very different, um, very different set of skills that I didn't have at the time. So, yeah, learning from Andy was absolutely brilliant. Um, in terms of the the desire to develop coaches, um, I think it, it probably extends to the reach that you can have with with what you do. Um, so I can maybe influence a hundred athletes in a year, whereas if I'm influencing ten coaches who have 30 athletes keep the maths nice and easy that that's 300 yeah so you yeah. can uh, positively affect um, the lives the development of more people which then hopefully leads into those athletes having a more positive life experience and then more likely to do more positive things and influence more people so hopefully it's that kind of chain of chain of kindness chain of positivity without getting too kind of left field with things yeah yeah i always think of it as it's just better leverage 
right? Or or another analogy would be, you know, throwing the pond or the stone into the pond, right? The people closest to you are your athletes, and those are the ones you have the strongest and deepest impact on. But that doesn't mean you don't want that ripple effect. And so that's why, you know, kind of selfishly, I guess, or unselfishly, depending on how you look at it, that's why I've written articles and, you know, created this podcast and shoot the videos because, like you, I want to create that next generation of great coaches. And it's not going to magically happen on its own, right? We need people that are willing to put themselves out there and, and try and push the industry forward. So I really respect what you're doing, man. That's awesome. 100%. Right back at you. Right back at you. <laughs> so here's a tough one, because as anybody that's mentored young people knows, it's kind of cliche, but critical thinking skills, super important right? Not just being spoon fed everything, not taking everything that's said on the social media for, in, for, uh, for granted or at face value. So how are some ways that you work with your young developing coaches to help them cultivate those critical thinking skills? Yeah, it's a tough one. Um, I mean, we've got a few strategies, but probably the most, most impactful is just trying to harness effective questioning. Um, and I think that's at the core of critical thinking. It's creating an environment, be that um, be that if a coach is working with me as an intern or be that in a kind of teaching capacity. Um, trying to create an environment where questions aren't just kind of tolerated, but actively encouraged. So mm -hmm. just asking why, like, why are we doing something? What's the rationale for this? Why are we doing X and not Y? Um, so trying to understand the reasoning and the rationale behind things. Um, same as we mentioned with our athletes and um, that understanding the reasoning, hopefully they can kind of promote that critical thinking and they can start to analyze things and offer alternative suggestions and things like that. Um, challenging assumptions, uh, assumptions, easy for me to say, <laughs> um, is a big one. I guess there are kind of lots of things that are just accepted uh, and taken at will. Sure. Um, so some of the, the tasks we do with our students is just get them to, defend an alternative approach to something yes so just throwing something at them and go why would you do that what's the rationale for that what's their thinking even if it might be something that we would suggest is not the not the optimum solution why might that yes. still be a useful solution and in what circumstances yeah. might that actually be the best solution um multiple solutions is another one like if we have a problem that we're bringing to the table i want to make sure you're coming with at least two solutions to that. So it's clear that you've considered something. So that's one rule we'd have whenever we're working with a, a problem-based situation, you have at least two solutions. So you've not just taken one and got fully down that path. So we're making sure that we're, we're encouraging, um, yeah, encouraging the exploration of alternative options. Probably the other big piece is just exposing them to as diverse a situation, experiences, coaches as, as possible. So, I've done lots of things to to just challenge myself a little bit over the course of my career, be that be um, like I wanted to get better at sprinting. So I joined the local athletics club. Um, yeah, I was interested in what yoga could offer. So I joined a yoga studio and practiced that and, and still do to some extent. Um, dance classes, improv classes, like just things that are going to challenge you and you see different approaches to teaching, to instruction and, and challenge some of the areas of your, your abilities that you maybe thought were unimportant. I love it. So two points I want to note here. Number one, I love the idea of when they ask a question, making them think through potential answers first. So you kind of alluded to this, but when, instead of somebody just asking, why do you front squat, right? Or why do you do this activity? And then we just spit them out an answer. I say, well, why do you think I do that? Right? So now they have to have a little bit of skin in the game. And if they're right, great right? Their rationale and their line of thinking is similar to mine. That's awesome. And if not, okay, flesh that out. And then I can talk about why I do things that way, right? So regardless of whether they're right or wrong, it deepens the learning process. And I feel like they get more out of it. So yeah, hundred percent. And you can start to get the little nuggets as well. Yeah. So yeah, what does that do to the load? How do you notice that the trunk angle changes when they do front squat versus back squat? So yes. you're, you're starting to push them towards stuff but not spoon feeding them the answers. Yes, love that. And then the second piece, and I think this is even more important, the older you get and or the longer you're in the industry is find ways to be a beginner again. Because 
it's really easy if you've done this 10, 15, 20 years, you've had a certain amount of you know reps and experience and success to forget what it's like to be a total newbie at something. So like you alluded to, you started sprinting, right? You went to yoga class, dance, improv, find ways to be a beginner. So, you know, my son is kind of getting into tennis. I'm like, you know, I, I've never played tennis. Maybe I'm going to go take tennis lessons just to put myself in that uncomfortable zone of being a beginner again and remembering what that feels like. Because I feel like it just helps kind of like, it, it dampens the ego a little bit. And it reminds you that, hey, just because you're successful in one thing, there's plenty of successful people in all these different realms and you can learn from them. And ultimately, it can make you better in your target area by going back and remembering what it's like to be a beginner and look at life through those eyes. Yeah, it's amazing how quickly we forget, isn't it? Um... <laughs> yeah, yeah I, I think, yeah. So a lot of times I target the show towards like beginner coaches or young coaches. I think that's one... If you've been doing this for a while, find ways to make yourself a beginner again, because it will humble you and it will also make you far more patient when you are working with and mentoring young coaches, right? All those questions that bother you or get under your, you're like, oh, how do they not get this? Okay. Those are probably the exact same questions that we asked when we were getting started, right? We're just old and jaded now. <laughs> so, all right, Sean, I got one more question, then we'll start to wrap this up. When we are going back and forth on email, I just, I love your philosophy and your approach. But one thing you said was that you don't want to be known as a specialist, right? Or you don't want to just be known as a badminton guy or a basketball guy. Why is that? Probably two answers here. And it's very different from a personal standpoint versus a, a business hat on standpoint. Um, mm -hmm. Probably from a business standpoint, it's not the best marketing strategy to market yourself as a generalist. Right. And I guess most of my work and a lot of the referrals have come from from particular niches. Um, so I have been the guy that's known in badminton and the guy that's known in basketball or cricket or whatever it is, or weightlifting. Um, yep. But like, it's important for me not to pigeonhole myself as a specialist because I believe in the power of um, that kind of broad, versatile skill set. Um, and I think strength and conditioning is a very, it's a very diverse set of stuff. There are so many different pigeonholes and things that you can delve into in the realm of, of physical preparation. Um, so I think there are a lot of advantages to being a generalist. Uh, I mean, number one is the adaptability, the ability to put yourself in different situations and be across enough to understand and then know when you need to go deeper into those specific rabbit holes for for a particular situation. So it allows you to have that more holistic approach, I think, um, allows you to draw from a wider range of experiences and it allows you to recognize more patterns and then put in place, hopefully more tailored solutions. Um, just ultimately giving yourself a, a wider, wider toolbox. Um, yeah. Becomes particularly important when you're dealing with some of the more complex problem solving things. Um, like generally, generalists are better problem solvers because they have a more diverse selection of experiences to, to draw on. Um, yeah, the, the cross pollination thing is just, yeah, it's, it's more fun. I think it's more enjoyable to be across different things, to be able to then delve into specific rabbit holes as, and when you need it or as, and yeah. when it, it takes your fancy and you want to develop a certain thing. Um, but ultimately it comes back to you being better as a strength and conditioning coach to give a better experience to the athletes in front of you. Um, yeah. I, I think it's such a, an important distinction, right? And you stated it very clearly. I think a lot of us would benefit from looking at things from a more macro and global level. Like you said, there's times and places where we want to zoom in on certain areas and that's absolutely important. But sometimes when it comes to the business and the marketing, maybe you have to be more targeted and more direct, right? Because the scattershot approach, you know, they have the saying of, you know, when you market to everybody, you attract nobody. It's that kind of thing. So in your marketing, maybe it is, hey, we're great. We're elite at basketball or badminton. But also when you're reflecting on yourself, you don't think of yourself as just a badminton guy or just a basketball guy. You're a coach that can also dive into those areas and provide solutions to some of these complex situations that you might come up with. Yeah, 100%. 100% on that. Very cool. Okay. Big question time, my friend. If you could alter the space-time continuum 
and give young Sean Maloney one piece of advice, what would it be? Cool. I think my answer would probably change on a monthly, if not weekly basis to this. Um, <laughs> I think the one I'd probably come back to most would probably be go to therapy earlier. Um, and I think there's been times where it's not always been particularly helpful in terms of the situation, but it certainly some of the teachings have given me a better understanding of, of me as a person. And they've definitely made me a uh, better friend, a better partner, but ultimately better coach as well. Um, yeah. So yeah, that would probably be my answer of the week for that one. Okay. Okay. I like that. I don't think I've had that one before. That's a new one. Everyone should try therapy. Everyone. Yeah. That's cool. I like that. Oh, I take that back. Maybe Molly Galbraith said that because I know she's talked a lot about how important that was for her and her own healing and getting through some, some stuff that she was dealing with. So, and I also like that we're in a place now where we're so much more open about talking about these sorts of things versus 20, 30 years ago, there was such a stigma about seeing a therapist or they thought there was something wrong with you versus no, this is something that a lot of people can really benefit from. Yeah. And, there's a lot more, a lot more focus on social media. Um, so some great yes. accounts like uh, the holistic psychologist. Um, yeah, definitely okay. want to want to follow. I'll definitely check that one out. Okay, last but not least, we've got our lightning round. So four fairly short questions. Your answers can be as long or short as you like. All right. Here we go. Number one, what's one way we can start empowering our athletes right now? Ask them what they want to work on. Um, and then make sure that when they get their next program that you're showing them how what they've asked for is being delivered in the program. So they need to feel like they have a voice, but they need to feel like that voice is being listened to. Um, yeah, that would be, cool. be the starting point, I think. Very cool. Okay, number two. Did you have a coach growing up that you really looked up to or admired? There's probably been a few in that kind of starting point in my career. So Andy Olford would, would definitely be up there. Um, going back a little little younger um yeah a couple of PE teachers um would have missed a davenport that would have been kind of high school age and just somebody that was kind of really fun enthusiastic and got yeah. you excited about pe so yeah probably something like that would, would start of yeah sowed the seeds for for yeah. a career in, in athletic development yeah i'm i'm always interested to hear because i think as most coaches we learn a lot, right? We're always pulling whether we know it or not when we're young kids. And I think most of us have that blend of hopefully mostly good, but then also some bad coaches and all of those experiences help mold and shape us. So I'm always interested. Number three, really interested in this one. What kind of numbers are you putting up in the Olympic lifting and sprinting games these days? Well, you'll probably get a good, good reflection of how average an athlete I am from this. Um, <laughs> I can only work in kilos. So um, English masters will be coming up in a few months for the weightlifting. So I'd like to post kind of 180, 185. Um, again, I'm not sure what that is in pounds. Um, yeah, yeah. And it's been my first season, uh, well, first proper season ever running track as a masters, which has been fun. Okay. Um, in uni, I had a sub 12. Uh, best I've had this okay. year is a 1207 uh, with a little I bit mean, of wind. that's good. So I'd like to go sub 12 yeah. again. I think as a, as an old man, that's, that's decent. That's amazing, dude. Good for you, man. I, I just respect anybody at, I'll just say our age, right? <laughs> anybody over 35 or who can start classi classifying themselves as masters, submasters, any of those, anybody that's still out there in the game, I'm impressed, dude. So keep it up, man. Keep it up. Last but not least, number four, what's next for Sean Maloney? I think just keep swimming. Um, it's a busy time of year, so academics um, just getting underway. Uh, basketball season just started. Uh, youth group super busy. Cricket guys heading into off season. Uh, end of year championships for badminton. Yeah, it's going to be a busy time up until um, up until Christmas, I think. So uh, just keep swimming. Yeah, I love it. Well, Sean, this has been amazing, man. Thank you so much for your time as well. Thanks so much for just the the effort that you're giving and the energy you're putting into your young coaches and your young athletes. I really respect that a lot. So where can my listeners find out more about you and the great work that you're doing? Um, I guess the best place, uh, standard social. So Instagram, Twitter, X, whatever it's called now. Um, <laughs> if you're interested in any of the academic paper stuff, research gate, um, 
if the papers aren't on there, you can always send me a message and request them and I'll, and I'll send them over and old school email. Um, yeah, I'll, I'll do my best to answer anything that, that comes across. Um, might be a couple of days for a response, but, but you should always get one. I love it, man. Well, Sean, this has been really amazing. Thank you so much for your time and for coming on the show, dude. I really appreciate it. Absolute pleasure, Mike. Thank you very much for the invite.